Hola, comadres. Welcome to another episode of Comadre on the Podcast. I am your host, Marcy. And today we have a special guest. His name is Jason, and I'm going to let him introduce himself. Who What's going you? on, everybody? Uh, Jason Enrique, host of the First Class Second Place Podcast. Uh, thank you guys for watching, and thank you, Marcy, for having me on the show. Okay. So um, Jay and I connected via social media, and we both had podcasts, um, and I was on his show, First Class Second Place, at the beginning. And since he is a movie buff and... Um, like a media buff, we decided to come up with this topic together, which is autism in the media. And the reason why the topic came up is because we've discussed this already several times on the show. And, um, you know, it something happened recently that's a little problematic and we're going to be discussing it today. Right. Right. Yeah. And I just also wanted to reiterate that I personally don't have anybody in my life that suffers from autism or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. Um, I don't really, it, it's not really affected my life or anybody I know personally, but nevertheless, I'm very sympathetic and empathetic to those that, you know, go through this and are doing amazing strides into, you know, making this world a better place for, for, for these kind of people. Thank you. So, um, let's get into the topic. Mm -hmm. What is your profession? I am a truck driver. Okay. Uh, uh, that is my day job. And, uh, you know, I've also been doing the podcast as well. I've been doing a lot of networking. Um, and, but yeah, that's that's uh, basically my life. Basically, my life is just being on the road, whether I'm podcasting or I'm trucking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and what made you decide to pursue that career? As far as trucking or podcasting? Both. Okay. For, uh, I'll start with trucking first. Um, I basically, and it's actually funny because they kind of intersect the two in a way. So I'll try to condense it as much as I can. Yeah, yeah. So I started uh, driving for, for work back in 2005. Mm -hmm. And at the time, the only thing that I was able to keep myself entertained in the car, because, you know, we didn't have iPods or anything like that just yet, just CD players and, and radio. And mm -hmm. I was listening to the radio a lot. And it got to a point where I was actually listening to the on-air personalities a lot more than the actual music, because the song, could, the same song could be playing every 15 minutes and you get sick of it. True. But I was listening to the to the on-air personalities. Like I was listening to a lot of sports radio. I was listening to Howard Stern. I was listening to a lot of Hot 97, but I was only specifically cared about the people that were on air. Now, Next thing you know, I'm kind of like subconsciously imitating them and also kind of working on my craft and my hone and my, my, my skills and my voice and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Not even realize that I'm doing it. So then, um, there was a point where I actually wanted to get into the radio business because of this. Mm -hmm. So I went to a school, which, uh, used to be in Hasbrook Heights, New Jersey, but it's not there anymore. Um, they wanted me, but they didn't have any special financial aid programs or anything. And I was working a dead end job at the time. I was not making a, a good living off of it just yet. So I couldn't afford school. And then uh, fast forward to a little forward uh, in time, I decided to go into truck driving because I did a bunch of uh, other odd jobs. Like I was a bartender. I was a waiter. I worked at a bank. I had an office job at one point, retail. Mm -hmm. But none of them seemed to really grasp me. And I didn't want to do anything. I, but I needed to figure out what to do with my life, mm -hmm. especially at the time when I was really in, in need of some kind of income, some yeah. substantial income. So. I kind of went back and I thought, well, I really enjoyed the, the driving job, but that's not something that's going to make me, you know, uh, uh, you know, have a, a sustainable life, so to speak, you know, yeah. especially if I want to have like, a, you know, wife and kids and house and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. that's when I decided to get my commercial driver's license, CDL, so that I can actually make a proper living while doing something like that. And then um, I still enjoy it to this day, but there was a point where I felt like I was just living a, a very ordinary life where I was just going to work and, you know, living like an ordinary citizen, not doing anything extravagant. And it kind of like depressed me for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. because I felt like I needed to do something else. Like I still want to do this, but I, I need to get some kind of creative juices flowing. You felt like a little bit monotonous in that Exactly. Sense. Yeah. That was the word that I was looking for. Thank you very much. And, uh, then I, and then I figured, you know what? If I want to, if I want to look ahead, I got to look back. Yeah. So that's what I did with the trucking thing. I mean, I went back and realized that I, I love being on the road. So let me do that full time as a truck driver. And I went further back and I also realized that, well, I did have an affinity for radio and that's something that really, you know, grabbed my attention as far as creative uh, creativity goes. Mm -hmm. So uh, now we live in a time where podcast is the new wave. And I've, I actually prefer podcasts as opposed to being in mainstream media because it's your own creative freedom. You can do it however you want without the personal politics getting in the way. Yeah. And the radio business is a dying industry anyway. So this is, you know, I'm better off doing this. And uh, I'm glad that I'm on this trajectory of life. Uh, you know, I'm much happier. I'm much more at peace with my mental and everything. And uh, 
all the accolades and all the, the, the acclaim that I've been getting from the podcast has been very overwhelming, especially since it hasn't been even been a year yet. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really excited about what's to come in the future. And, you know, one of the best parts about it is that I've been able to meet so many great uh, content creators and uh, podcasters, such as the one to my, my right right now. <laughs> all right. So um, what, okay, you already said what made you start the podcast, but right. tell the audience about it. Like, why did you name it first class, second place? <laughs> That's a question that gets very, uh, that I get asked a lot. And um, to, to your audience, I'll explain it uh, as, as condensed as I can. Well, I, I have a little bit of an underdog mentality. Yeah. I've always felt like I needed that to have an edge. So, but I also believe in my talent. I believe that I could do a first class show, but I've always been in second place. Like I've never been really on top. I've always kind of been behind. I've always uh -huh. been the underdog. Uh, so I kind of wanted to just mesh the two and, you know, create a title that has something to do uh, a a along that ilk. So that's why I believe it I could do a first class show, but you want to keep me in second place. All right. All right. I am not opposed to that. So um, you said it hasn't even been a year. So when's your anniversary for your podcast? This is funny because my anniversary for the podcast is September 30th. And I didn't even know this. Ah. The day that I released it on September 30th, I found out after the fact, after I published it, that it was National Podcast Day. Ah. I didn't even know that. So that that's at that time, I figured, you know what? I'm going to take this as a sign that maybe this is what I'm supposed to be doing after all. True. Yeah, but yeah, just so anybody else that is not aware, September 30th, National Podcast Day. And that'll I be the know. one year anniversary of my show. <laughs> <laughs> um, I released like one approximately a month after you. So we started October 27th. That's when okay. we aired for the first time. All right. But I think what's also awesome is that the both of us have been consistent. I mean, we both taken breaks in between here and there because it's, it's, it's necessary. You know, everyday life happens. Mm -hmm. But I love the fact that you, me and a handful of others that we know personally have been able to stay consistent with it as opposed to some people that they figure that I'll get into it. And then afterwards, uh, never materializes and I, i've never talked about this on the show but podcasting is hard guys it's not just having yeah. the conversation and like you know oh hey what's up hi i'm <laughs> comadres whatever no it's a lot of work yeah for those who are not podcasters you need to realize that you're just watching the best part and the easiest part about this yeah but what happens be behind the scenes and before and after that's the real crux of it that's the real hard part about doing this stuff but right now you're just catching the the fun part and we love what we do though so like yeah, absolutely i honestly can spend hours editing an episode or putting together material or like you know putting together social media posts or reels or whatever and that i can spend hours doing like i don't mind that at all right and i think that's a testament as to why we enjoy doing it because if we weren't willing to go through all of that work all that you know that grime stuff then we wouldn't that we we didn't have passion for it. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that we're actually willing to put the time and the energy into it shows that we really, truly love it. Yeah. So let's get into the topic. We're going to talk yeah. about autism in the media and mm -hmm. the portrayal of autistic individuals. Um, what are your thoughts regarding the portrayal of autistic people in movies in general? We can pick one movie. Let's start with Rain Man, because that's like the most famous one. That's arguably the most popular uh, character of, uh, of all time in Hollywood that deals with autism. OK, so can we give like a like a synopsis of the movie for the comadres for the people that haven't seen it? Because, we Absolutely, don't know, yeah. you know. All right. So uh, um, I haven't seen the movie in quite some time. But what I do remember from it is that uh, the, the main characters are played by Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman, who plays uh, Raymond, who is the autistic character. And their brothers, I think I think they were estranged brothers, like they haven't seen each other in a while because mm -hmm. Tom Cruise was just doing his own thing or whatever. And Dustin Hoffman's character was in a, a facility, you know, being taken care of. And um, I think it had something to do with an inheritance. Uh, I don't know exactly, but basically Tom Cruise's character had to be involved in some way, shape or form uh, to be there for his brother. And long story short towards the end he realizes that they've become a, a much bigger stronger bond than they any of them thought that it would be and uh it's actually a very nice story and it has a nice you know a little bit of an emotional ending but um what i what i think what's 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 famous about that film more than anything is uh dustin hoffman's portrayal of raymond who uh is a person who is autistic and he was he, Dustin Hoffman is a very dedicated actor, and he really did a lot of research into doing the role, and it, it happened to pay off for him because he won an Academy Award for his mm -hmm. performance, and that would be arguably his most popular performance that he's ever done in his career. And the interesting thing is that 
that movie was made in the in the late eighties. Not only did it win uh, Dustin Hoffman the Academy Award, but actually won Best Picture of that year. Mm. So it was it was not a negative portrayal of autism at all. If if anybody see knows that Dustin Hoffman really did his research and his homework, and he you know did the the character respect respectfully. However, if this was a movie that was brought now. If it wasn't made back then and it was brought to, you know, Hollywood steps right now, then because of the world that we live in, it uh, it'd only be, be right and perceived better that if it's actually portrayed by somebody who actually does have autism. Yeah, that and then the fact that, you know, now because of the way that the media is and how people are very close minded, especially people that have never met people with autism, right. they can think that every person that's autistic is Rain Man. And the autism is a spectrum. So mm -hmm. like there's people that can be like Rain Man, right? But they can be people that are like nonverbal and have like a lot of difficulty in society. Right. So, you know, what my thing is with the media, the biggest, my biggest gripe is that there's not that much representation for everybody on the spectrum, you know, mm -hmm. and and we can say the same thing about other other groups of people. But um, in general, like definitely having people that are autistic playing the roles would be a lot helpful and also you know showing more people on the spectrum not just like the top tier because right. like rain man is like uh, back in the day there was different classifications of autism um we can say that rain man had asperger's which is like kind yes, of socially yeah. awkward right right and you know there's actually some famous celebrities that do have asperger's mm -hmm. as well like uh, daryl hannah has it uh dan Aykroyd is probably the most uh popular uh, example of that and you know because he's one of the most famous actors in the world mm -hmm. with with all the classic movies done but he has been um you know to my understanding in my research he was diagnosed with it very recently oh wow okay mm -hmm. that's interesting yeah you know is that who they told me um my compadre was actually talking to me about this the other day um seinfeld jerry seinfeld jerry seinfeld oh, wow. thinks well he hasn't been diagnosed completely but he's been reading a lot um on the like um uh, comorbidities and like um the difficulties people with autism have mm -hmm. and he can relate a lot to it i mean he hasn't been fully diagnosed but he thinks that he can be but and then looking at the way that he is and the trouble i mean because the show is based on his life a little bit right and and larry david the co-creator who i you could actually make the argument that maybe he has a little bit of that as well because he's a socially awkward guy even though he's real hilarious yeah so the the whole thing is that um they have issues with especially like the um the guest i had before um the person that she talks about love on the spectrum mm -hmm. she had a lot of issues in life in general, like her entire life until she was diagnosed with autism. And then she like, everybody would always tell her like, Oh my God, you're so rude. You're mm -hmm. um, this, you're that. And they would like label her like quote unquote crazy or like she's a B I T C H, you know? And um, you know, a lot of the people that are undiagnosed, they use a lot of masking to be able to pass, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to be accepted by society. So um, there might be more. So we don't know. But definitely Rain Man is one of those um, up there. What was another movie that that we saw somebody with? autism portrayed um i can't really think of off the top of my head of um but i know that uh, not too long ago um we had that movie uh, i think it was called music that was directed by sia mm -hmm. which is a very controversial film unfortunately i haven't seen it personally i just heard the the, re the kind of reputation that it has so sia directed the movie um she didn't cast anybody with autism on the on the movie mm -hmm. um the movie was paid by Autism Speaks, which the biggest thing with the biggest gripe in the autism community against Autism Speaks is that they are all run by people that are not autistic. And their point is to eradicate autism. Mm. So they're not letting the kids be themselves or the people with autism be themselves. They want to get rid of autism altogether. So, um, you know, it's not really a, an organization to uplift and help and like, you know, shine a positive light on people with autism. It's more like there's something wrong with you guys. You need to, um, you know, 
acclimate yourself to society and all of that, which is um, really heartbreaking because the thing is, Autism Speaks is like one of the biggest national organizations, right? Right. And they're in the media all the time and they do all kinds of events. And you would think that they're um, dedicating that money to help people with autism, but they're not. Right. And you know, what's interesting is that uh, I, I know somebody who's a friend of mine who's actually coming on the show uh, not, uh, in a little bit uh, next month. Um, she has a brother that's autistic. Mm -hmm. And I remember in a, you know, like, I would say maybe five, six years ago, they used to do these events uh, for Autism Speaks. Mm. And I think that if I'm not mistaken, there was like, she had a tattoo of it on like one, on, like her like ankle or something like mm -hmm. that. But, you know, I guess the perception of it has changed now. And that's something that I'm really interested in talking about or see how it goes. And I've seen her with her brother mm -hmm. and she treats him no different than any other human being. She's absolutely, she, abs she absolutely adores him. He's the sweetest kid in the world. I've actually had a chance to meet him a couple of times mm -hmm. and with with a little few instances here and there you would never think that he was autistic the thing is with autism it's not that it's not that people are so different autistic people are just like you and me they just have different um connections right. so like the way that their brain works they do the same things that we do. It's just that they do it in a different way. So like we'll figure out how to do something, but then they'll think about it in a different way and solve it that way, which is like what I love the most about working with kids with autism, because it's like the way their brains work is like really, it's just really surprising. And the way that they solve problems is really surprising. Right. No, let me ask you this question. Um, in the case of your son, um, with that same sentiment that you just asked, that, that you just said right now, um, how would you how would you give me an example of how your son is able to you know do these kind of things or like how he he, he communicates or you know shows his emotion in different ways? Well, he he does a lot of scripting. I know you haven't hung out with him yet, but um, no. he does a lot of scripting. So um, so you see movies and and shows and things that we watch right. on TV. He remembers the script like. Mm audio like he's like he has a very good aud auditory memory so he will remember all the scripts right and then the thing with him is that now he uses those scripts to communicate so he'll say things that he's heard in shows but it applies to the situation mm. so for example like the other day like the video that the, the video the reel that i uploaded the other day with him and the dog he's like yes i, saw I was that, like what yeah. i was like what does drug on smell like? he's like fresh laundry and i'm sure it's something <laughs> that he heard on tv but it's like you know he's using it appropriately to communicate and which is just, interesting and not just him using those words specifically but the way he said it, yeah. fresh laundry you know yeah, he probably yeah. heard it somewhere and you know uh it, what's funny is that one of the what, there's actually a movie that popped into my head that it wasn't a very big popular movie it was at the time but it does depict uh autism in a way mm -hmm. and i don't know how accurate it is so i i don't know if anybody remembers the movie mercury rising with bruce willis the, um, mm -hmm. Do you remember that movie? Uh, somewhat. I don't, yeah. I don't think I actually yeah. watched it. Okay. Well, the synopsis a little bit is about um, there's this kid who's autistic and he is looking at a, a, a crossword puzzle book. Mm -hmm. And while he's analyzing it, he realizes that there's a secret uh, government code that is included in there. Oh. And he, call, and he calls whoever needs to be called as far as government is concerned. <laughs> I remember now. Yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah. then afterwards, they, uh, they, the government goes after to, uh, you know, assassinate him because he figured out this, this code that's supposed to be like top secret. And, oh Bruce, my God. and Bruce Willis plays this cop that is protecting this kid and trying to like uncover the truth behind this conspiracy theory. That's crazy. I know. So it has it has an interesting concept the movie actually wasn't executed all that great um because i think first of all it was marketed wrong uh they when the commercials came out it was marketed as like an action movie but it turned out to be something that's a little bit more complex and deeper than that yeah and the, i know for a fact that the actor the young kid who played the autistic kid is not autistic in real life because okay. i've seen him in other movies where he was totally you know just like you and me mm -hmm. you know um and I thought he did a, a decent portrayal of it. I was convinced that he was autistic, mm -hmm. but that goes back to the idea of like, if that's a movie that is made now, it'd have to be done with an actual autistic actor instead of somebody just doing the classic uh, acting training and research and so on and so forth. Yeah. Cause like, honestly, representation matters. It's like taking somebody like, what was that movie that um, they used a, 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 a person not of color to play a Japanese person? Um, oh, um, uh, Breakfast Ghost in the Cell? No, Ghost in the Cell. 
Ghost in the Cell. Uh, I don't think I've heard. I don't think I've seen that one. But look it up. Look it up. It, I think it was like Scarlett Johansson, and she was supposed to play. Oh, Ghost in the Shell. Okay, yeah. Yes. Yes. So Ghost in the Shell, Scarlett they Johansson. Called it, they was, called it whitewashing. That's what it's called. It is, but what I'm saying is like it's representation, regardless. Like whether it's a person that is a person of color or a person with a disability, like we should be using people that actually have the disability to, um, you know represent them not only that but sit in these rooms as a reference like let's say you're not gonna you can't find the, an actor that you like to cast into that role which i doubt right but using a person that has autism as a reference like hey do you think this is okay to say or do on the movie but mm -hmm. the thing is this is this is what it goes back to like they're trying to make the quickest buck and they're not actually trying to you know go a step further and do that um have you seen the show Queen's Gambit on Netflix? Oh, uh, yeah, I did watch it. I don't remember all all of it, but I do remember it. I did see it. So they were, some people were arguing, that was, this was like online, that um, she could have been autistic. Mm -hmm. The way that she was seeing the patterns in the in the chess um, um, game. Yeah. You see, when she would look above and like look at the patterns, mm -hmm. that, that was like a representation of autism in a way, which is um, a lot of the time, I feel like with my students, like, they can see things in a different way. So for example, like I um the other day I was watching this video of a little boy. He was obsessed with the 21st century logo, you know, the one that comes out at the beginning of the movie. Oh the oh yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So the way he he would he drew it on paper and then he would like angle his face as if it was the camera. You know how the camera comes yes, up? Yes, like it comes like yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. So he would angle his face like when the camera came up and like to see it that way. Um, another one is Temple, um, the movie. Did you ever watch Temple Grandin? I don't think I've ever heard of it. Okay. So Temple Grandin um, is one of like the most significant um, movies uh, about somebody with autism for me because um, I actually watched it as soon as it came out on HBO. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, they did not have a person that was autistic um, portraying it, but they did have Temple Grandin, which is the person who the movie's about, as a consultant in the movie. Mm. So Claire Danes did a really great job portraying somebody with autism. And um, I don't feel like that portrayal of her was offensive, obviously, because like Temple Grandin was okay with it. But um, let me just give you a synopsis. So Temple Grandin was diagnosed with autism. She was a female diagnosed with autism, which is rare. Right. In like the 50s, I want to say. And um, she... Back in the day, you know, they didn't, they said, they basically told her mom she was never going to talk. So the mom, mom put her in, uh, she like started working with her directly and she was able to talk eventually. So Temple um, really got interested in cows. So she ended up studying bovine science and she became a doctor of bovine science. So she was able to develop um, these machines to, um, to be more gentle with the cows mm -hmm. so that when they go off to the slaughterhouse, they're not like scared. Um, so she, the way that she was looking at it, she, like she was able to visualize what the cows were seeing. And then you would see how like she would look through a little crack. And I love how that movie like shows what she was seeing when mm. she was like looking through the little crack. So it was like, it was giving a lot of um, the point of view was very rich to me because it, it was like giving you a glimpse of what she was thinking and feeling at the time. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually do remember that there was another movie back in 1999. Uh, it was with the actress Elizabeth Shue and she played a, an autistic uh, character named Molly. Um, what movie was that? I, I didn't see it. I was just kind of, I just, just stumbled upon it during my research mm -hmm. of, you know, uh, well, before we got into this topic. And I don't remember off the top of my head of what the last line of the movie was said, but at the time it was considered as something like inspirational, like, you know, like somebody that's trying to bully this character. Um, but she's, you know, coming out on top. But now when you look back on it, when the, the, the last line that this character says, and I don't remember it off the top of my head, I can't even look it up right now. Now, but if uh, if you were to go back and see it, it's actually like very damning. Like it, it's almost like it's almost like they say something along the lines where like it's okay for them to be R word or something like that. 
it, it was like terrible. And, you know, to my understanding, it was not a good movie anyway. It got horrible reviews and everything. Oh so. so I, in the show, yeah, I already told you, but I hate that word. Like, right. like it makes me like cringe in my stomach. It's, it's really upsetting. And, um, I mean, we grew up saying the word, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. We did. As kids, like it was like, normal for us but like you know as we get older and which is another thing i want to go back to the point it which is you know as time and and society evolves we need to evolve also in the way that we're casting people and that we are depicting people with autism right and this also goes to show and you know uh that sometimes uh, people regular people in society they're the ones that are are they're the ones that are responsible for, for ruining things like if you really think about it the r word that we don't, won't discuss here that's actually technically a medical term but then people everyday people you know insensitive people decided to use it in other insensitive ways as an, and now, insult. As an insult and now we're the only people we're the only species it seems like in this planet that could take an actual medical term and make it derogatory mm -hmm. that's how that's how messed up society can be yeah in my opinion um did you ever get to watch uh love on the spectrum no i did not so love on the spectrum is one of my favorite shows yeah. um it casts it's a show or a movie it's a show on okay. Netflix. by the way uh, not to cut you off but i i just it's funny how like in this day and age of progression we're starting to finally learn terms and words like i had no idea that on the spectrum was actually a term to describe autistic people i yeah. just i just recently found out about it and you know I'm i'm a little late to the party i'm sorry but at least um at least I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that I live in a world where I'm actually still able to learn about this every day. And this is not something that ultimately affects my life, but I'm learning more and more about it. I'm, be I'm becoming more knowledgeable on the subject. And I think it's a great thing. Yeah. So, uh, well, I didn't really know anything about autism growing up, really, because like that wasn't a diagnosis that was like widely known. You know, right. we knew people that were in special education classes, but we didn't know why or um you know, they would have like a physical disability that that's seen, you know. Right. So autism is um, big because it's like an invisible disability. There's people that ha suffer, um, not suffer, have autism and you wouldn't be able to tell, right? Unless you were able, like they were able to, you know, speak to you right. about it. There's been a couple of people that there's um teachers that I've worked with that are on the spectrum. They haven't disclosed it to me, but because I've been working with people on the spectrum for such a long time, I'm able to identify the traits and the characteristics. Um, it helps me be a little bit more um, patient also mm -hmm. because, um, you know, I expect me from everybody, which is bad. And I'm working on that. I know that <laughs> you're only human at the end of the day. I know. But like, you know, I, I would find myself getting annoyed sometimes at certain people. And I'm just like, why am I? Why is it bothering me? And then like I'm <laughs> sitting down and reflecting and I'm like. Oh, they're persistent because this or they're doing this because of this. And they might be, you know, a person with a disability. Right. right. And the whole thing is with me is that. We have all these children that have special needs, right? They grow up to be adults. Yeah. And they're in society all the time. So, you know, acting with kindness is like one of my biggest things. Um, so definitely um, that. But going back to the topic. Yes. Um, Love on the Spectrum. So it's my f one of my favorite shows. So they did a series in the UK and they did one here in the USA. And um, all the people on the show have autism and mm. they're basically trying to find love. And um, it just like follows their journeys through all of that. And oh. um, it, I love that show because they show so many different sides of autism. Um, most of the people are verbal, though. So, you know, also that, the, you know, because there's people that can be not be on the spectrum and right. and be nonverbal as well but um you know it, it does a pretty good job of representation and the actors i love like mm. they're like the sweetest and you definitely need to catch a couple of episodes all right yeah maybe i'll check it out um one thing that i think i researched and uh, I'll, I'll see this question that it's kind of like a little bit off topic but but it's still staying in, in the realm of topic i do believe that especially now in this day and age, there are people that are on the spectrum that are actually getting acting gigs, but they're voice acting gigs. Like maybe they'll get like gigs for like a cartoon or so on and so forth. And I think it's a good thing, but do you also think that it's, you know, they're doing it to be progressive or do you think that they feel like the flow and the cadence or whatever is, is, is just what the formula that's needed in order to, you know, portray the, the cartoon character that they're voicing? I think it's, it's, 
it's a two way street because mm-hmm. honestly, like my son can do voice. <laughs> I was, I was, and I was actually thinking about that too. Like, like you my know. son can do voices, like, and it's, it's, he doesn't even try. Like, um, <laughs> there's this one story. I'm gonna drop a clip of of him reading it, but um, the name of the story is called "Click Clack Moo Cows at Type" by Doreen Cronin, mm-hmm. and Aiden memorized the entire book. So he's hyperlexic, which means that he can read college level words, like he can decode wow. them, but. His comprehension is not all there yet. But he's able to pronounce them perfectly. He, he can read the newspaper. That's awesome. Like the New York Times. Mm-hmm. He can read. Um, he can. He, he even taught himself how to read in Spanish, which I never taught him. But he, wow. because of the I phonics, I can't even read in Spanish was, either. So <laughs> he's he's already on a much higher level than me. <laughs> because of the phonics that he learned in the English language, he's able to translate right. that to Spanish. And how, yes, and how old he is has, he? He's 13. And I'm 36. So he's <laughs> <laughs> ironically, I have to do more catching up. <laughs> so, um, so going back to the story. So, yeah. um, Doreen Cronin calls that type. Um, I think he saw it one time on YouTube and he taught himself how to say it, like read it mm-hmm. exactly with the diction and cadence wow. of the voice actor. So he does like, <laughs> he's like, Farmer Brown had a problem, and <laughs> da, 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 da. and I read, I read very animatedly. Like That's when I read cute. to my students, you know, I read very animatedly. And then, like, I found that he was like also like copying the way that I would read things to my students, which was like super cute too. So, um, another one that his another favorite of his was um, a oh um. Dr. Seuss, which is canceled, but um, yeah. <laughs> one of the Dr. What else Seuss is canceled books, this day and age? But no, but know. like you. No, I know, I, I know the whole story. We're Dr. not going to get into Seuss that. Dr. Seuss was but. like um, the cat in the hat, so um, he knows the entire thing by like he can. If he wasn't into audio um, editing right now, right. I would like put him into voice acting because Aiden's voice is like he can change the pitch and tone and like cadence. He can do accents. This dude can do like British accents. Wow. And this is all from <laughs> watching TV. So like he watches a lot of um um kids cartoon shows. So like Niha Kailan, which is like in Mandarin. Well, part of it, it's like bilingual Mandarin. Okay. Um, he does uh a lot of the Peppa Pig and stuff like that, oh, which okay, is British. Yeah. So um he still says zebra to this day, guys, and and I'm just going to leave him like that because I, I can't convince him to say zebra. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's uh, he's not really wrong. I mean, if if he were to say it, at least people understand what he's saying. No, of course. Yeah. yeah. But um, another another show uh, is atypical. I've heard of it. Haven't seen it. And also, just so you know, uh, you know, uh, you know this, but You're I'll let more, your audience know. He's more of a movie person yes, than a TV like, person. Yeah. I, I, chances are, if you did ask me about a movie, chances are I've seen it. TV shows, I may have heard of it, but I don't actually, I don't know. Maybe I just don't have the time or the patience to actually sit through an actual show. That's yeah. Just so but um, I can't get into Game of Thrones, but we're not going to get into that right now. We're not talking about Game of Thrones <laughs> on the show, sir. <laughs> Um, so, uh, atypical is a show about a teenage boy who is coming right. of age and his mom is like a helicopter mom, but he's like fighting to be independent. Um, I like the portrayal and I believe the actors on the spectrum. Yes. Okay. So yeah, so he, he does, obviously he does a great portrayal of himself, but, um, I love, I love the fact that they do show him having like meltdowns which is like something that kids people with autism deal with you know and and it's not that they're having um they're being like malcriado or like misbehaving it's just you know over sensory overload right and so then the thing is when they're having the meltdown they're just like trying to get themselves back but then they they don't know in that moment how to get themselves back there right one of the things that kind of worry me about that though maybe it's not really nothing but it's just a thought that crossed my mind is when you have uh, an actor that's on the spectrum and they're portraying and they're do, they're doing a scene where it requires them to go to that dark place that they that, they, that is needed for their character does it ever affect them internally also when the camera when the when the director yells cut because you know they went kind of went to it like a rabbit hole and it, it kind of sticks with them and they got to shake it off as well um i feel like the, the actors that are that are doing the the shows they have coping mechanisms so the thing okay. with the the meltdowns you can if you know your triggers you can get yourself back to zero 
you know okay it's like it's like through the tools or like therapies and things like that they can learn ways to get themselves back you know to to imbalance or being copacetic right and i was just wondering because i know that there's some you know actors that are you know method actors like i guess a perfect example is uh he led lee ledger when he did the joker mm -hmm. like he really delved deep into that character to the point where it basically cost his life Mm -hmm. because he went down too much of a rabbit hole in his in his mental state you know you know trying to like study the character and everything uh you know got a little bit too much for him and you know this is just a you know a, a normal human being that he was just an actor that was just trying to perfect his craft mm -hmm. so i was just wondering if that uh you know you know i'm thinking kindly here about you know what people that are on the spectrum if you know what certain triggers if uh if, if they if, if you you said that they know the triggers and they know how to handle it and so on and so forth mm -hmm. but i was just wondering if sometimes if they delve too deep into their character does it you know m m uh, mess up with their mental or anything like that no i'm sure that the the especially the way that um everything's set up now i'm sure they're like making right. sure that their their health and well-being is at the top of the thing okay good because that's my biggest concern more than anything so let's talk about a movie that i do know that the character is supposed to be on the spectrum but and um also the actor Actor is on the spectrum as well. Mm. Um, I don't know if you're into this, but is it a show? No, it's a, it's a, it's a movie. It's okay. um, uh, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Uh, yeah, I know, yeah. So Eddie Redmayne. Yes, I know who he is. Is on the spectrum supposedly. Oh, okay. I heard, and then um, the character Newt's commander. Mm -hmm. I was talking to my friends about it, and we were analyzing all the all the things that he does. So like. He's socially awkward. He prefers to be with animals rather than with people. He's, um, what is it? He like, when he goes into like these little niches, like he, it's hard for him to like get out. And I'm just like looking at him. And I'm like, hmm, he could be autistic. <laughs> so I started looking on, um, what is the, what is the forum that everybody talks a lot about? Like different technical things. Oh my God. Um, I don't know. I'm drawing a blank right now. Anyway. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, people like post Reddit. I was looking on Reddit oh, and they okay, were saying yeah. that, yeah, that he he's definitely an actor that seems that he could like not an actor, but the character of Moose Commander is definitely somebody that could be on the spectrum. Oh. So the, I think that's fan theory because I don't think that J.K. Rowling has actually confirm that as of yet mm -hmm. but um I, I i mean i really the fact that eddie redmayne is might be on the spectrum and then the fact that the character is on the spectrum as well is like i love that because it's like you it know there's authenticity to the character for sure. yeah and and i don't know i just love i love the way that he portrayed him and it was very like soft and it's not like uh it's what not it, over the top. It's not over the top, and it's not um, ca it's not a caricature of a person there with go, autism. Yeah. So I love that too. Um, have you feel? Wait, okay. So based on because we we've gone from the eighties all the way to like now, mm -hmm. do you feel that the portrayal and depiction has changed over the years of people with autism? I absolutely think so, and 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 for the better and for the positive as well, because. Mm -hmm. You know, aside from the fact that nobody wants to get canceled in this day and age, <laughs> but I think more so than anything, which is actually the best part, is that they're actually more understanding. They're more understanding that this, like, is. Remember how I said earlier that I didn't realize uh, what the term on the spectrum was until not too long ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm just an example of people that are mm -hmm. constantly finding out things about you know these type these type of topics and so on and so forth so it's it's actually beneficial and the more that we learn and the more that we understand that we can actually you know be in a place of uh you know of understanding and you know it, it just makes it, it just makes society a much better place in my opinion i agree um it has changed a lot and the fact the, sorry guys so the fact that um you know they're including more people with autism in the in the media mm -hmm. and all of that but like like i said before going back to my point you know i want to see more people with different types of autism in the in the media like it, it can't just be like people that are you know, socially awkward. Or right, right. Whatever. Not, not the, not the most common ones. You know, yeah. the one that you could tell that they actually are on the spectrum for obvious reasons. I mean, yeah, that like people with behavior issues or you know things like that. Like, 
I yeah, feel like they, the like shows they, do a little bit more. Right. But I, the sense that I'm getting at is that you would like to see more actors or, or, or people on the spectrum actually doing, you know, roles that they're perfect for that doesn't necessarily focus so much on of being on the spectrum is what you're saying yeah like talking more about their lives and stuff like that not like oh i'm autistic and i'm having all these difficulties it's more like you know a story of a person and it just so happened that they have autism mm -hmm. you know like a little bit more um like a different layer of yeah. their life exactly yeah just you know a portray that side and, and, you know, you get a better understanding of who these people are. Yeah. And also that, you know, one of the great things also is that they're able to blend in, you know, just because these people are on the spectrum, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that they, they, they can't function in regular society. It's just a different approach. That's all it is. True. So, um, let's get into, wait, so, all right, we're done with the topic for now. Um, mm -hmm. If the comadres have any other movies or, or shows that they like of people that uh, that talk about autism or that, um, you know, have people who have autism as the actors, um, send us a little list in and we can check those out and, you know, revise our list. Absolutely. So um, I was going to ask you, so you're taking those hiatus right now from your show. Right. What's next for first class, second place? So um, I realized that uh, <laughs> it's funny because I'm, I'm somebody that is a little uh, stubborn in the sense that uh, something has to happen to me in order for me to actually get the point. And in this case, I was working a little bit too hard with my day job and also doing too much of the podcast now. I think it's just a testament of how much I love doing it. Mm -hmm. But I also realize that I'm not Superman. I got to get my rest every now and then, and, and I don't want to get burnt out. Um, so I, you know, basically I had to like learn the hard way that maybe I just need to like give myself a little bit of break, you know, just there's nothing wrong with, you know, watching out for your mental, making sure you didn't get burned out or whatever. But I also want to use it as an opportunity to do some upgrades. Mm -hmm. So as of right now, the show, which you can find on Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcast. Uh, I want to elevate it more. Like it's just an audio show right now, audio only, but I'm trying to elevate it in the sense that I'm trying to do more visuals. I have had a lot of people that are requested, you know, being on YouTube because they actually want to see the show instead of just listening to it. Mm -hmm. And I can understand that I'm, I'm kind of on the same level as that is concerned. And I also want to be proof to myself that I, I don't want to be afraid of the camera. You know, I'm, I'm already being open and honest with my audience so much that I should, I should be able to peel back a little bit more and give myself the full me instead of just you know being open open and honest with everybody but be hiding a, a, a metaphorical mask mm -hmm. or so on and so forth and uh, one of the things also that i'm realizing about elevating the show is that the more that i meet people and the more that i work with other colleagues and podcasters and content creators is that they kind of inspire me to want to do better and elevate the show more and i feel like if if the accolades of the show have already been good and people have been enjoying it and they they legitimately think that I have what it takes, then why not elevate it more to the point where uh, people can actually, you know, get into it a lot more mm -hmm. and, and consume it more. And, you know, it'll be better for me and it'll be better for my audience. Yeah. So the next step is uh video. YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Um, I convinced him cause he was being <laughs> hard headed. I'm like, listen, I did tell you I was hard headed. Yeah. Listen, it's the, I, in me. <laughs> cause the thing for me is that I think about the different learning styles and, um, there's people that cannot just listen to something. They need to be able to see it as well. So, um, you know, right. to be able to reach everybody and the way that they learn and the way that they um, absorb information, definitely having a visual helps. Um, I've had my little YouTube channel for, I want to say I, I launched like a month after right. the show started. And um, it's just part of like another extra step in the process, honestly. Right. And, you know, um, this also goes into line with, uh, you know, before I started the podcast, how I was procrastinating. And what I mean by that is before I actually put out any episodes, mm -hmm. I felt like I needed everything to be perfect. Like I needed to have the perfect equipment. I needed to have the right camera, the right mm -hmm. mics and, and, and like, you know, possibly set up the way that I want the background to be, you know, to make it look like a, a, a professional show. Mm -hmm. I was being a little bit too much of a perfectionist. And what it was doing is it was actually stunting my growth and stunting my my ability to actually put it out there. You know, I became mm -hmm. this person where I kept on talking about, oh yeah, I'm starting a podcast, I started a podcast, but I sound like everybody else that says they want to do it and they're not doing it. Yeah. So 
I was like, you know what? Uh, if I don't put this out now, then it's not going to happen. And even though it's not ready, it's not set up the way I want it to be. Uh, if I don't do it now, then it's not, it's not going to happen. So I just said, screw it. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to put it out there and then I'm going to learn on the go. And I actually appreciate that approach now because now I know what I can do to make the show better and not also burn myself out or make myself go crazy because I'm being too much of a perfectionist. Yeah. You know, like learning on the go is not a bad thing at all. Yeah. And also your audience is forgiving because I, yeah. you know, at the beginning, my, sh my episodes weren't the best. I mean, they were good, mm -hmm. <laughs> but <laughs> they're not at the, they weren't at the level that they are now. Yeah. And um, the organization isn't, wasn't at the level that they are now. Even my video editing skills have gotten better. Um, sure. If you go to my YouTube channel and um, you look at the first videos as opposed to the videos now, completely different very different aesthetic um you know and then also now i'm like messing around with like adding like little visuals like because i teach what because i'm a special education teacher and a bilingual special education teacher i like to use a lot of visuals while i'm teaching so i'm trying to implement that into my videos so if you guys head on over to my youtube channel you'll be able to see the fact that i'm um popping in little um graphics and things like that like to make the videos more entertaining and more um como te digo like um to draw in more the the audience yeah yeah and that's what you have to do you know like we live in a we live in a time now where you know and i, I guess this is going back to my wanted to be in the radio days where all i feel like i had to do was just do my research and then get behind the mic and then just do my thing but now it, it's so much bigger than that like you got to worry about editing you got to worry about video you got to worry about reels you got to worry about social mm -hmm. media you know you got to elevate the, the the yourself and the show as much as you can mm -hmm. but like i said what i was alluding to earlier in the beginning of the show that we wouldn't be doing this thing if we didn't enjoy it yeah yeah i agree bueno comadres um i'm going to end the show here um as always follow me at comadreando pod and you can follow jay at uh jason enrique underscore on instagram and twitter and you could also follow the first class second place podcast page on instagram as well and i'm newly on tiktok Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm I a little late to the party, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, but that's what we were talking about. Where you know we need to be on top of the social media game as well. You yeah. know, I, uh, everybody was telling me you got to have TikTok, you got to have TikTok. But initially, I didn't get it because I thought it was just something that people were doing when in the pandemic, where they were just doing all these crazy, silly all dances, dances or whatever. Yeah, and I know. thought like, man, do I really have to sell my soul that much in order to get you know the I recognition? I mean, it's not about <laughs> selling your soul. No, so. no, no, I know it's not, but that was my way of thinking at the time. You know, but. Uh, the more I learned about it and people can actually use it for networking purposes, I'm like, okay, why not? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Jason, Jason Enrique underscore on Instagram, Twitter, and newly TikTok. Okay. And then, you know, you can follow me, Comadre on the Pod, everywhere, mm -hmm. Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook group, <laughs> Facebook page. Right. Um, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to send me a Comadre Gram at marcy at comadreandopod.com or slide up into my dms <laughs> it works um thank you for spending time with your comadre and your compadre thank you very much bye appreciate it duck was a neutral party so he brought the ultimated to the cows the cows had held an emergency meeting all the animals gathered around the barn to stoop, but none of them could understand Moo. All night long, Farmer Brown waited for an answer. Duck knocked on the door early the next morning. He handed Farmer Brown a note. Dear Farmer Brown, we will exchange our typewriter for electric blankets. Leave them outside the barn door and we will send Duck over with the typewriter. Sincerely, the cows. Nice reading. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs>